Hey, Lee Robinson here at American Sentinel Canine. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate your support. In this video, we're going to discuss pursuing your goals as a breeder of working dogs and how to be successful in developing a family of dogs with consistent, excellent performance. Now, perhaps the steps in this video may help you with some of your other goals, but the video is for the breeder of the working canine. Now, if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up or perhaps even click the subscribe button because we do appreciate your support and that helps the channel grow. Well, let's start off with a quote from Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius says, if it's not right, don't do it. If it's not true, don't say it. And if you um, don't believe in that, there are some people that have another quote, fake it till you make it. I've always hated that quote because the fake it till you make it quote is based upon building a foundation that's a fallacy and you will never be great if your foundation is a fallacy. You might be worldly su successful, you might even be worldly popular, you might even make some money, but you'll never be great because it's all a fraud. I think it is important to build a solid foundation and this is going to begin with honesty and integrity and principles. There are people out there that are trying to claim 150 pound dogs as being pit bulls or whatever and if that's their thing, hey, they're preying upon the ignorant because anybody with any education knows that that's a fallacy and they're never going to be great because greatness comes from being recognized for the success not from the ignorant. The informed and competent individuals need to look at you and say, wow, that person really has done something. And while you don't have to like what I do, you can still be appreciative of another person's success and say, they're good at what they do. And that's cool, as long as it's honest and right. And with that said, also remember that even if you live to be 100, if there's only 365 days in a year, that means you have 36,500 days. 36,500 days might seem like a lot of days, but to me it doesn't seem like a lot of days. I know like $36,500 can go pretty quick. And it seems like to me that now that I'm more than halfway through the 100 year mark, because I'm in my 50s, um, I know that my days are limited and I hope to live to be 100 because I still got a lot of goals that I want to pursue. And I need to use every day wisely. And if I'm not pursuing my goal on any given day, Two things that I need to remember. Somebody else is. So if I'm not doing my goals on that day, I need to be doing something that matters. Like spending time with my family, taking a good rela relaxation uh, break uh, to refresh my spirit or something else that matters. I can't be wasting my time. I need to be grinding and tr pursuing my goals every day. So Marcus Aurelius, remember, always do what's right, always tell the truth. And remember, er another quote from Marcus Aurelius is, live every day with a passion as if it's your last. Because if you do that, you won't be wasting your days. Now, next, be true to yourself. Whatever your goals are, you're gonna encounter people that try to manipulate your goals or, or to tell you that your goals are wrong. Don't worry about that. You need to establish your own goals and be true to yourself. You're not going to be able to, when you're 90 years old, say, man, I've only got 10 years left if I live to be 100. Can I go rewind and live this life over? Because I just now realize I've been living the life that my parents wanted me to live. Or I've been living the life that our society wants me to live. I'm not living the life that I want to live. Well, when you're 90, it's going to be a little late. So find out what your goals are and go for your goals. Do it now and put your goals on paper. See, another quote from another famous individual who was very successful because we should learn from people who are successful. We don't need to learn from haters. We don't need to learn from, learn from uh, fools that don't achieve anything. We need to learn from successful people. This individual is George Foreman. He said, plan your work and work your plan. Plan your work, work your plan. It's that simple. Sometimes the roadmaps on how to get there can be changed and we might actually change our plan a little bit, but we do need to have a solid goal. So get that goal on paper. If you're not willing to put your goal on paper, then your goal is not really a goal. It's not even really a dream because if it was really a dream, you would probably actually turn it into a goal and plan it. If all you want to do is think about it, it's an illusion. And you know it's an illusion because if it wasn't an illusion, if you really believed you were going to get it, if it was really a dream, a vision that you had, you would put it on paper. Uh, there was a study that showed uh, successful people that they interviewed and they found out 
every single successful person that they interviewed put their goals on paper. Then they went out and did some studies with society. They realized only about 10% of the people in society put their goals on paper. 90% of the people out there in society did not put their goals on paper. Now, when they interviewed the 90% that did not put their goals on paper, none of them had obtained their goals. Out of the 10% that did put their goals on paper, some of them obtained their goals and some of them did not. But the ones that did obtain their goals, every single one of them put them on paper. Put your goals on paper. If you're not committed enough to do that, you're not committed enough to even talk about success. You shouldn't even be watching this video. It's not designed for you. It's, this video is designed for people that want to pursue their goals. Go put your goals on paper. Take the time to put your goals on paper. Okay, next. Don't be afraid to try something different than other people. There's a lot of people out there that say this can't be done or that can't be done or if you want to do that, you have to do it this way. And you, while you should learn from people that have been successful, that doesn't mean you need to copycat what they do. If you want to be an original at something, you sometimes have to be willing to do something that nobody else has done. And this is going to be essential when it comes to being great because greatness isn't really something that's uh, based off of copycat success. It's based off of doing something new, something original. And so when I became a breeder of, my, of the American Sentinel, I really didn't even at that point have this vision of producing the best working dog in the world or anything like that. My goal is to produce the best dog that I like. That's my goal. The, the dog that I think that's the best dog in the world. That's my goal. And to do this, I have to realize what do I want this dog to do? I want the dog that I produce to be adaptable enough to live in my life, but also be an asset. Not just be a companion, but it needs to be a companion. Otherwise, it's not going to be in my life. This individual needs to be a loyal companion that can also bring something to the table. And I like to hunt. I like to, when I was younger, I would kayak and hike and, and fish and um, things like that. I camp and things like that. So it would be cool if my dogs can do those things. But now I basically just take care of my family and do a little hunting. And so I want my dog to be protective of my family and do a little hunting. And that's why the American Sentinel is a protection dog and hunting dog. And I think it's a combative hunter because the combat combatant skills uh, that you need for hog hunting can be a benefit to protection work as well because both of these types of individuals need to be able to deal with adversity and stress and to be able to overcome it to impose their will on their opposition. Okay? So... Don't be afraid to try new things. Now, with that, when you try new things, you're going to get haters for two reasons. One, you're doing something that is unusual. And because you're doing something that's unusual, there's going to be people that sit on the bench that say, hey, you're not following status quo over here. You're, uh, you're being uh, foolish. Uh, they're bench warmers that don't know anything and they never achieved anything, so you can't really worry about those people. Those people, their only achievement in life is going to be when they're 90, they're going to look at the thousands of memes that they made online. Um, but they never really have their own substance. They're just counterproductive people. Don't listen to counterproductive people and negative people. Listen to positive people that are successful. Listen to productive people. But the, even then, don't just copycat them. Put your own twist on how you can take their work, if that's what you like, but then take it to a higher level by modifying the approach. Because if you just copycat them, you're just going to become them. You're not going to become something uh, great. Okay? So the other type of hater is the hater that wants you to do what they want. See, I have uh, one group of haters that I have to deal with quite a bit in the, the canine protection sports industry. Um, and the, these canine protection sports, they seem to think that I don't like protection sports. And that's not true. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. When I retire from teaching, I may even pursue some protection sports on my own. But I say may because that's not my number one goal. But I can still appreciate what protection sports do, which is allows you to test the dog's drives. They allow you to test the dog's nerves. They allow you to test the dog's physical abilities. They allow you to test yourself as a trainer. And these things are important. But the reason why, and, and I think they're great. The only time I have really an ad adversity with the protection sports is when somebody in a protection sport is offended by the word sport being called out as a game. Because a sport is a game. These dogs that are competing in protection sports are never really tested in terms of severe physical adversity. They're never hurt. Uh, a criminal is going to hurt your dog. Sorry to tell you that, but the criminal is not going to uh, just always give your dog a biscuit. 
uh, when you're there, especially, that dog's not going to be fooled by a biscuit. There's going to be conflict, and that dog is now going to be, become aggressive, and that criminal's going to try to hurt your dog to stop your dog. And hogs don't just roll over and say, hey, capture me. Hogs fight back. And so these, uh, a reliable protection dog and a reliable hog hunting dog has to be a dog that will impose its will despite stress. And a protection sport is a dog that imposes its will as long as the rules are followed in the game and the dog because of, of many 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 hours that it takes to be successful in sports eventually learns this is a game and the rules are going to be followed and I'm not going to get hurt now they may not know this initially at the very beginning of the training but and I think some of the early steps of training have more validity than some of the later steps unless you're assessing the dogs the dog trainer now the trainer is going to be very important to get to a competitive level, but that's not my thing. See, I'm dealing as a breeder more so than a trainer. And so as a breeder, I'm interested in seeing the raw components of the genetics that the canine brings to the table and assessing it at that level. And so, you know, that doesn't mean sports don't have anything. They really do have benefit. And so I'm being, I'm over explaining this because I don't want to offend the sport community, but at the same time I do because it's not my, primary goal and some people are offended that that's not my primary goal but hey it's not my primary goal go do your thing I have no problem with it. I think it's great but I'm not pursuing sports because that's not my goal my goal is real adversity overcoming serious adversity and protection or hog hunting now next uh, now to overcome adversity one of the things that I like is a is a game dog I like a dog that is committed to the task so when adversity does show up the dog will work right through it. And in this regard, I've used the term uh, game band dog before, and there are some people that take offense to that. They think uh, game bred band dogs and game band dogs don't exist, and I kind of laugh because I know for a fact they do because I've created them before. And the reason why these individuals think they can't exist is because they don't know how to get there. But I'll tell you, gameness is just a genetic trait. And if gameness can be captured in game breeds like the American Pitbull Terrier or the Patterdale Terrier, then uh, it can also be captured in the American Sentinel Canine or Band Dogs. A uh, quality Band Dog is a dog that should be game because if the dog is not going to um, be reliable, then that's going to leave the hunter or the victim of a crime to be exposed to serious physical injury. And we don't want that to happen to a person that's buying a protection dog. They need to know that their dog will have the genetic ability to, to endure such punishment and remain engaged for the safety of the owner. And a hog hunter that's dealing with an animal that has tusks and is fighting uh, very aggressively, they need a dog that's going to be committed to maintain its hold because if that dog lets go of its hold, not only can the dog get injured, but the owner can get injured as well. A dog that's in hold is much more difficult to injure than a dog that lets go and, and starts to give that hog a distance to strike. All right, so um, now with that said, some people think gameness can't be obtained in a band dog. And so I have my haters, but I can't let that stop me from being successful. The real punches I'm going to take are not my haters. The real punish, punches that I'm going to take are going to be when I have invested into something extensively and it fails. See, no program is going to have 100% success. If you think you're going to have 100% success, don't even get into the dogs because every program is going to have setbacks. The thing is, are you able to build and move forward from that because those those punches, they're going to sometimes knock you down, but you got to get back up and keep moving forward. All right, there's a quote from Rocky Balboa, right? So you got to be willing to take your punches and keep moving forward. And when you have those setbacks, sometimes it's going to be frustrating because you may have great investment. Somebody arguing online is not a big deal, but a great investment, losing that investment, that, that can hurt sometimes, but you just keep moving forward. You work with the lines that are, that are still being successful, and you revise uh, what is not working, or even scratch it off the table and get rid of it, and build your population off the ones that are successful. And this allows your program to take it to the next level. So, stay focused, okay? Move forward from the haters, move forward from your failures, and stay focused. This is absolutely essential. Work hard. You have to put in the grind every day. You have to put in your study and you have to put in the grind every day. 
When your father or mother passes away, you have to put in the grind. When you're sick, you have to put in the grind. When there's a tornado outside, you have to put in the grind because these dogs depend on you every day. And if you don't take care of them, you can lose your whole program. So you always have to work every day. Okay, this is just part of who it is, or this is just part of what it takes to succeed. And with that said, you need to study. Plan your work and work your plan is something that I discussed earlier, but I talked about the planning aspect. Now I want to focus on the work aspect. The work doesn't just mean go out and physical labor. While a lot of it's physical labor, there's also going to be other aspects of work, like doing the labor when you don't want to. That's sometimes harder than the labor itself. You're going to take punches and you got to go do the work. And you also need to study. You're going to have to pick up a book. Some people don't want to pick up a book. You're going to have to go pick up a book. You need to go interview successful people. You need to go find the best bloodlines that you can. And that means you might even have to step outside of your comfort zone to find some blood that you know has really good genetic potential, but it might be from venues that you uh, kind of wish you didn't have to tap into. But what I'm talking about here is the Game Bread American Pitbull Terrier and its history. I knew that the game bred American Pitbull Terrier was bringing gameness to the table. So, you know, when I first started, we used some uh, Bonacorsi blood from the weight pool dogs. And while some of those dogs were extremely good, I didn't just get weight pool dogs that were because they were weight pool dogs. I went and looked in the record books and I found Bonacorsi's Porky. Why Porky? Because he had demolished the old records in weight pool. The 80 pound weight pull class is probably the most competitive class in weight pull that there is. And Bonacorsi's Porky was in the 80 pound class. And in the snow pull competition, which is probably the hardest pull there is, because pulling a sled on snow is very difficult. Pulling it on a cart with wheels is much easier. Pulling it on rails, you can pull thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of pounds on rails. So when we're looking at the snow record, let's remember that it's a much harder event. And the old weight pull record on snow was 800 pounds for an 80 pound dog. 10 pounds of weight per pound of dog. And Bonacorsi's Porky demolished that record. He pulled 2,000 pounds. So he didn't just beat the record, he destroyed it. And they actually invented a new class after that because nobody could touch that record. That's the type of weight pull dog that I went to get blood from and I got two directly sired by Porky and another dog that was produced by another uh, great dog that Bonacorsi had and when I contacted him uh, Bonacorsi about the dogs I already knew I liked Porky but so I didn't talk to him about who's your favorite stud because the record books told me that dog was in the record books and this is what's going to be the sire to the dogs that I got from Bonacorsi so instead when I called him up and said hey who are your best females and he told me and he named some of his best females and then from there, I made choices based off the traits that he described to know that I wanted a pup sired by these two females. And so I got a, one of them was Rosie. I remember Rosie. And so we got, uh, uh, I said, when are you going to breed Porky to Rosie? So I already knew the dogs that were in the record books. And so I got two dogs from Bonacorsi. And within three years, one of those uh, dogs was erased from my program, even though it was an investment. And that's kind of like one of those punches I was talking about. The other uh, dog that I got, there's a still a small, small, like 3% of that blood in my program today. But I ended up getting rid of most of that blood and focusing on some of the other lines that I had that I felt like were working better. And that was going back to the game bred dogs. See, when I went into the game bred dogs, I looked up also the record books on them. Longest combat, the highest win to loss ratio the only dog in history that has beaten three grand champions. When I looked at those, they were all Sorrell's dogs. So I said, hey, I need some Sorrell's blood. I got to know Bert Sorrell's fairly well. I fed his dogs for a week. Um, I got to know Madison Parker, who was the backbone of the Sorrell's program when it came to a lot of the breedings and all the conditioning and much of the handling. Um, so I got to know that bloodline really well. So I had a really good inlet to some of the best game dogs ever to exist on the planet. And that's became the backbone of our American Sentinel program. And this is one of the things that separates our program from most band dog programs. Because most people just think, oh, Pitbull Mastiff. And they get the Pitbull down the street over here and the Mastiff up the road over there. And that's not the way I did it. I found the best Mastiffs in the country. And 
I went and looked at them and 95% of them failed. So we didn't use those. We found the best and we tested them and we only used like the top 5%. And we did this with the, the weight pool dogs and we got mo rid of most of those. And we also did this with the game bred Sorrells dogs because the Sorrells was the best of, the, of the, some of the game dogs out there. And then when I still, I had to go and work those and find the best ones of those to use. And so you have to sometimes be willing to step out of your comfort zone and put in the work to find the best blood that you can. And if this means stepping outside of your comfort zone, hey, you, if you want to be great, you got to sometimes do things like that. Okay? And then finally, make sure you're dealing with honest people. There are some people out there in the dog world that are just like used car salesmen. Like we spoke earlier at the very beginning of the video, a guy that's claiming uh, his 150 pound dogs are pure pit bulls. It's just absolute nonsense. Make sure you're dealing with honest people and there's going to be times that you can't tell and you're going to have to do your due diligence of study to find out are there records of these events and then you're going to have to spend some time interviewing these people to look for consistencies and inconsistencies in in the their reports and if you're dealing with somebody who's talking off both sides of their mouth then uh, you, you, you might want to just go a different direction. You need to find people that are honest and that display a lot of integrity because you're going to be relying on the information that they give you to make some of your decisions. So anyway, that's it. I hope that you have a blessed day. And again, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up or click subscribe. Y'all take care. Lee Robinson from American Sentinel Canine. Have a blessed day.